Hello, I'm James Fitzsimons and welcome to The Career Scoop, a podcast all about career progression, advice and experiences aimed at assisting those who are in career transition. Today, my guest is David Mulville. David is the chairman of Dataflow International. I'm delighted to welcome you to the show, David. Thanks, James. Lovely to be here. Great to see you. Just to kick off, you've, you have had a, a fabulously inter- interesting career. Um, you might just give us a very quick overview how you ended up in Beirut. Sure. Well, um, I'm Irish to start with. I went to school in Dublin. Um, I studied uh, law in university, but never went on to progress uh, working in the legal profession. Um, uh, out of college, I moved to London to work uh, for the London Stock Exchange as a graduate tra- trainee, which I did for about two years. And then I was very fortunate enough to get offered a job working back in Dublin with the Irish Stock Exchange, uh, where I worked as uh, head of financial regulation for uh, until 1994, um, during which time uh, we were involved in doing quite a bit of international consulting work with emerging markets and other countries that were establishing equity uh, exchanges. Uh, And I did a bit of work in Malta and subsequently in Saudi Arabia. And through that, I ended up being uh, offered a job to go and work uh, in Beirut in Lebanon in 1994, which was pretty much the immediate aftermath of the Lebanese civil war, which had finished a couple of years before that, uh, and was then undergoing a huge reconstruction effort. So I joined uh, a company called Solidaire, which was leading that urban redevelopment, a little bit like uh, London Docklands or, or Spencer Dock development in, 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 in Ireland in recent years, that type of thing, but obviously on a very large scale uh, in post-war reconstruction. And I joined that as uh, head of corporate finance and I worked there from 1994 until 1999, whereupon I decided to come back to Ireland to try to catch the tail end of the Celtic Tiger as it was then and um, joined an Irish software company called Riverdeep which was uh, a very emerging uh, internet business at the time and um, I worked there uh, as uh, in in sort of transaction or corporate finance as well as uh, in charge of mergers and acquisitions and that company went through an IPO uh, on the Irish Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq exchange uh, and I worked there until 2006 uh, when I set up my own business uh, which is now the Dataflow International uh, business which is a group of companies focused particularly on e-learning um, uh, and I've been doing that uh, ever since. Fabulous, fabulous. I mean what, what, a, what, a, what a diverse uh, coming, becoming a lawyer and then getting involved in corporate finance and going to Beirut. And now you're, a lot of your work is in the Middle East, Middle East am, I, am I correct? Yeah, so today we have, um, we have a, a business that's really a software services uh, business that's focused primarily on educational technology and med, med tech, medical technology. Um, we have about 120 staff working out of our headquarters in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, and a small smattering of uh, staff uh, based in Dublin, and then a kind of a network of consultants that we use for various different projects on a project by project basis. Uh, but really our kind of our, our, our major staffing um, activity is all done uh, directly in region in the Middle East. And that's because most of our clients today, not all, but most of our clients are based across the Middle Eastern region uh, in countries like um, uh, the United Arab Emirates. So we have uh, major clients in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, We have clients in Qatar, in Saudi Arabia, uh, in Lebanon, and also in Libya, in North Africa. So quite an extensive reach around the Arab world. Gosh, and do you want to share with us the kind of the journey of making that happen from the start, having the idea, going to the Middle East and saying, let's make this happen. So how do you, how do you get your first client? How does that? Oh, I mean, I think there's, 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 there's the current career around data flow and there's the, the, how did you end up in the Middle East? question and I think they're albeit connected but slightly different um, uh, I don't know when or, or 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 how I developed the desire to travel it was never something that was the, at the forefront of my mind I guess when I started early in my career um, but l- working in, and living in London I think in the 
late 1980s, 1990s, a lot of Irish people had a lot of friends from Australia and New Zealand. We did too. And many of those people were career travelers. And I think that probably set the, the spark uh, about a desire to travel, hearing other people's stories about, you know, visiting different countries and so forth. Uh, all of a sudden that became more of a tangible possibility. And um, that kind of came to fruition when we were, uh, I was married, living in Dublin, uh, uh, newly married. And um, some of our Kiwi friends were doing a drive through from London to Cape Town, which was taking them eight months in a safari Land Rover. And I remember getting calls from uh, these guys uh, from a game reserve in Kenya telling us their stories of what had happened in the previous month and thinking, wow, wouldn't that be cool? Uh, and, you know, funnily enough, I was just starting my consulting activities and doing some work overseas. And the two things kind of came together. Within a month, I had been offered a job to go to live in Beirut uh, in a post-war environment. And I thought, well, why the heck not, you know? Uh, if other people can do it, it's worth it's worth rolling the dice. Worst case scenario, you do it for a year, a year you don't like it and you come home. Best case scenario, something better might happen. And I think it worked out uh, for me very positively for, for, for that uh, for that risk, I guess, that I took at the time. Or, or it was an adventure. Maybe it was not kind of probably what was. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt that was there was the there was the adventure uh uh, thing and realistically there was a financial thing as well I mean the ability at uh, a relative I was in my you know mid-20s the ability to go abroad earn real money uh, in a relatively low tax environment at least relative to Ireland at the time uh, but also with really great career opportunity you know in that business in Solidaire uh, we were rebuilding over two square kilometers of uh, the downtown of Beirut that had been completely destroyed and uh you know, when I went to work there, uh, not only was it Beirut, but it was in the middle of the worst part of Beirut that had been destroyed. I think our office building was the only building with glass in it at the time. And I had to go through four or five Syrian army checkpoints to get to and from the office every day. So it was a baptism of fire. And, um, uh, you know, I think that, that uh, you know, that, that, that project had fantastic ambition uh, and had raised a lot of money to finance money from the Arab world to finance the rebuilding of Lebanon, which was seen as a financial and tourism center in the Arab world and, and still is today. Uh, but the fact that uh, all this money had been raised uh, allowed us to do a lot of the things that were required to get the, the city rebuilt quickly. Um, uh, and from a financial perspective, you know, we ended up uh, floating or doing an IPO of that business on the London Stock Exchange. It was the first uh, Middle Eastern equity to ever go public on an international stock exchange and one of the very first emerging market businesses in the 1990s to go public in London. So it had some major international support uh, and investor traction at the time. Um, I mean, unfortunately, the long-term story in Lebanon didn't live up to its uh, um uh, it's possibility, I guess, uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, the country never recovered its its political stability to the point that the economic opportunity could be realized. And Dubai and other centers in the region really took over from the place that Beirut was, you know, was trying to occupy. Uh, but nevertheless, from a um, from a, you know, a project and a career standpoint, it was a fantastic uh, place to spend six years. Yeah. And I'm conscious, obviously, the last couple of, couple of weeks ago, there was a very tragic event in Beirut. Do you want to bring us up to date or the listeners up to date how, how Beirut is at the moment? Sure. So, so uh, unfortunately, on the 4th of August, there was a major explosion in the port of Beirut, which uh, if anybody, well, those who are not familiar with the geography of Beirut, it's a, it's a small peninsula that, you know, um, covers an area of probably about 10 square kilometers and um, is... Uh, you know, very, very densely populated. Um, the port area is uh, very close to major residential neighborhoods. And this, unfortunately, this uh, warehouse had been housing a highly explosive substance, uh, inert, but capable of exploding ammonium nitrate. And unfortunately, there was a fire. Uh, the warehouse exploded and a massive blast uh, basically created a huge amount of damage across the whole city including vast swathes of residential neighborhoods that were badly, uh, badly destroyed. Uh, fortunately, 
the death toll was way less than it could have been, probably due to the lockdown because of coronavirus. But nevertheless, there were major injuries. Uh, I think six or 7,000 people were injured. Uh, roughly 300 people were killed. Uh, but something like 50,000 residential units were badly damaged, meaning like all their glass was blown in and, you know, in some cases, entire buildings were destroyed, uh, including, unfortunately, our offices, uh, the apartment building where I live, etc., uh, were all badly damaged, um, capable of being restored. But that was happening on top of, or that happened on top of a severe economic downturn in Lebanon uh, as a result of frustration with the political uh, uh, class, I guess, in Lebanon, which has been accused of uh, being incredibly corrupt, uh, probably true. Um, but between political corruption, uh, economic hardship, anti-government demonstrations, a currency crisis, and a near collapse in the banking system, uh, which were leading, you know, uh, to a really, uh, really, really tough period of austerity for the Lebanese people. On top of that, uh, we had COVID, obviously, at the beginning of the year, which is exacerbating that. And then the final nail, I guess, uh, was this massive explosion that pretty much destroyed vast swathes of a major capital city. So uh, it hasn't been their best year, let's say. Is there hope going forward? I mean, they're very resilient, huge, resilient race. I mean, they're incredibly resilient. And, you know, I sometimes have to really shake my head and, and try to understand how people have done some of the things that they've done. I mean, in the case of that explosion, for example, in August, our internet service provider's offices was right beside the port and their building was, I'm going to say, vaporized. You know, uh, nothing could have survived it. And um, yet their service was back up online 24 hours later and they were calling us saying, oh, no, everything's fine. We're, we're back operating. You know, that type of thing really gives you heart that, you know, you're dealing with people that are, you know, for their own self-preservation, committed to making sure that they keep their businesses moving despite all the things that are happening around them uh, and despite the, you know, the dreadful kind of governance that exists uh, in a country like that. And, you know, I guess it demonstrates for me, certainly living through the COVID uh, crisis and, you know, being in Dublin since early March, the difference between living in a first world country and a developing economy. I mean, you know, we have, you know, despite our disagreements, we generally speaking have faith that our government aren't actually spending their entire time trying to collude to screw the people. Whereas in a country like Lebanon, they can't, <laughs> they can't come to the same conclusion. You know, many people say that this is just another, you know, example of how, the political class just doesn't care about the people and therefore the people have no confidence in their government. And that's a much different environment to how yeah. we live. We really don't know how lucky we are, do we? This we kind of, uh, you know, it's, one it's of the a, things I've learned over my career, James, is that we don't know how lucky we are. I mean, we can complain and we have the right to complain. And we have the freedom to complain and we have the freedom to vote people in and vote people out. Um, but relative to how people live in other countries, we really have it. Uh, we're, we're on the... The top shelf here, yeah. and you've you've been on, I suppose, on on the on the ditch watching this in in, in the Middle East. And I know you had a project in Libya, mm -hmm. and so you you have seen Libya when it was stable, and then when it became unstable. Do you want to share? Yeah, a little sure. bit around uh, that, So we we, that? we started working with the Ministry of Education in Libya in two thousand and six. So all the way back to when I set up the data flow uh, business, and um, you know that expanded into a much larger project uh, that we actually signed in uh, 2010. And we were away and running on imp implementing a, a large, you know, national software and e-learning uh, implementation when the Arab Spring happened in February 2011. And um, uh, the Gaddafi regime was toppled, basically, and uh, Libya uh, went into a sustained period of I'm going to describe it as, as only I can, as, as chaos. And um, despite the fact that nobody's arguing that the Gaddafi regime was a good regime or any of that, everybody realizes that, but there was no alternative and there was no, there was nothing coming behind it. Uh, unfortunately, it just led to the fracturing of the country and factionalizing everything and all these different political groupings emerging and then international actors getting involved, which further destabilized the country. And here we are, 
almost 10 years later, and really nothing has moved on at all since the collapse of the Gaddafi regime uh, in March or April of, of 2011. So, uh, and we at the time, uh, going back that far, we had about 60 people working on the project full time, a bunch of them working and living in Tripoli, uh, in Libya, who we all had to get out at very short notice and so forth. So uh, um, that was fine. Uh, ultimately, we got everybody out safely. Our projects went on hold for a couple of years and then we went back and renegotiated to reactivate them with what was effectively the new government. But even since then, that's just been sort of um, uh, rumbling along very, very quietly and ineffectively. And, and uh, you know, as I say, no, no real progress has been made in that country since then, which is a shame because, you know, it's a wealthy country. Uh, it has, uh, you know, a hardworking um a hard-working uh, labor force everybody was very keen to uh, get back to work and do what they needed to do to get the country moving there was a lot of optimism at the time but that seems to have petered out now being irish did that help in your journeys in the in the middle east yeah for sure do you want uh, to share any any funny stories or any any of that, that? Um, I, I think, you know, we've always loved the fact in Ireland that our passport is perceived maybe more neutrally than some of the other, you know, some of the global powers like, you know, like the US or, or the UK or whatever. Um, and, you know, certainly I've always found traveling around the Middle East that an Irish passport was generally speaking welcomed. Uh, but there are some specifics, I guess, at one time going into Syria by land, like on a car journey with a with a friend of mine from the UK, and we both showed up at the customs post, at the immigration post, to present our passport. And I was charged the equivalent of one US dollar, and he was charged the equivalent of fifty dollars. So uh, he came out raging about that, but we just say I was delighted. That that that, uh, that, 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 that that's a great story. That, that I've heard that quite. And of course, you would have you would have seen some of the Irish officers, uh, army officers, who were working for Unifil. And you would have come when they were coming in and out of of of, of active duty and uh, yeah, going back sure. to into Beirut. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at the time and and, and even still, uh, Ar Ireland had a, a major representation of uh, Irish Defence Forces working on behalf of Unifil in South Lebanon. Um, and when I was there, you know, from the mid nineties to the, at the end of that decade, there was probably roughly about eight hundred soldiers uh, in the battalion. Uh, in a place called Camp Shamrock, outside Tibnean in South Lebanon, just very close to the Israeli border. And obviously, being an Irish expat in Beirut, I would have gotten close to um, some of the uh, military folks that were there at the time. And, um, you know, we ended up uh, doing lots of different things together. Uh, uh, the Solid Air project where I was working became part of the sort of official tour of Lebanon for most of the different ministerial or business uh, or journalist trips for people coming out to cover the Irish military in South Lebanon. So, I mean, I, I've always had great respect for the Irish Defence Forces, but particularly having seen them up close and personal in Lebanon, uh, they're fantastic ambassadors for their country and uh, their reputation in the Middle East is uh, is really fantastic. Did, did, this might be a myth, this story. I, I, did I hear that the Irish army were rotating in out from maybe the Fijians and they hadn't got the code book so they started to talk in Irish across the uh, uh, back to base and the Israelis were listening in and then they learned Irish. Well I think there was a couple of Israeli, uh, Irish guys working for the or, you know uh, in the Israeli defense force at the time if I'm not mistaken it's the same if it's the same story yeah because I certainly heard a few stories from guys that were on checkpoints where an IDF, an Israeli Defence Forces tank would rumble along the road and there'd be a fellow with a Dublin accent uh, driving it. So, <laughs> how, how are you doing? How's it going? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's a big thing. What were the kind of three best work projects over the last, what, 25, 30 years that you could talk about that were just, and why? Um, Solidair is probably one. Obviously. I think Solidair definitely is uh, one of the kind of, uh, I guess it's probably one of the defining uh thing in the early part of my career because it sort of changed the trajectory of what I thought I would do with my business life, you know, in terms of internationalizing it and so forth. Um, I think, uh, you know, my time in Riverdeep, despite the fact that that business um, uh, would eventually have got sold into a US publishing uh, enterprise, 
uh, it, it it went public. It was very successful, um, uh, both in terms of, of of revenue growth. I mean, we did I think eight different acquisitions in a three year space and integrated those companies into one uh, one business and 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 brought it from something like uh, you know a really uh, a startup operation to something like two hundred fifty million dollars of annualized revenues. Uh, and then there was a management buyout. The business was taken private uh, off the stock markets in about 2004, um, and I left relatively shortly after that. But that was a, that was a fantastic experience in the in the sense that most of what we did there was in the US. So I got the opportunity to work between Ireland and the US for five or five or six years, uh, which was a brilliant experience traveling around but all would, parts of the. You United would have States. lived in a plane. You would have been a lot of miles, I presume. I would have been like a lot of Irish companies at the time. Uh, doing an awful lot of air miles. I mean, I was commuting regularly from Dublin to Boston and then subsequently Dublin to San Francisco, um, which is not an easy trip, you know, to do every other week, let's say. Um, but having the opportunity to work in America, which is a fantastic place to do business um, and get that exposure and, and travel across the country and go to so many different states and see, you know, see America from a business perspective, but also socially and learn to understand it a little bit better. Um, that was a brilliant experience. So I would say Solid Air and and River Deep. And then what I'm doing now, uh, I have to say, is 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 very different. You know, it's much more entrepreneurial. I'm a, I'm a self employed entrepreneur, I guess, at this point in time. Uh, so that brings with it all kinds of different uh, experiences and challenges, I guess. You know, but very enjoyable at the same at the same time. It, it, it's funny listening to you talk and and. and I- and I'm familiar with your journey the last couple of years. My, my sense is that you're really enjoying this journey uh, because it's there's complexities, there's logistics, but you have to make it happen. You don't. You have a, an engine per se that supports you. But going back to River Deep, where you had all these engines that could support you. Yeah, I guess it's the difference between working in a kind of an institutionalized environment and a non-institutionalized environment, which is very much reflective of what we are today. Um, so uh, that brings lots of challenges and, and you know, uh, lo- like a lot of Irish people, I suppose I've been doing that over the period of the recovery from the last recession, you know, in the financial crisis in 2008, uh, up to where we are today. So, you know, not only were we trying to build a business, but there was also legacy issues around uh, the recession itself, uh, all of which needed to be navigated. And, you know, I think there's a certain sense of satisfaction coming out of that a decade later that all of that's behind and our business is on a growth trajectory and doesn't look like a bad decision. That, 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 that's mm-hmm. fabulous. And so the, during, during the, 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 the growth of data flow, what do you look for, the, for in the people you hire? Um, I mean, I think the, the, the qualities in, in Ireland, I think we've had a tendency to uh, value the sort of mile wide and inch deep uh, in terms of technical capability, because a lot of a lot of Irish people, myself included, have relied on a, a bit of a generalist knowledge to try and become sort of quasi experts in a lot of different areas, and that can be incredibly effective sometimes, but it can also be quite destructive other times. So I think uh, uh, a depth of knowledge. I I I I I really value sort of people's expertise if they're competent at. Uh, and have the skills around particular areas. I think that's a huge strength. Um, uh, I, you know, we all have to say you never like to ask somebody to do something that you wouldn't be prepared to do yourself. But if you don't know how to do it, you need somebody to do it yourself. It's like developing a vaccine for COVID. I'd love to be able to do it, but I can't. I have to rely on the scientists. Or, or they do, have, doing a podcast. Or doing a podcast. Or you, you may go. not be technically yeah. competent. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think the other thing is problem solving. Um, problem solving is a huge issue uh, to work with people that are capable of figuring out how to get through issues, not just telling you how bad it is and what the problem is, figuring out how to actually solve it. Um, in terms of personal traits, I guess energy, positive energy is a huge thing. I find it debilitating to work with people who are you know, negative in their energy levels uh so that doesn't really work with me I, I i don't like going into a room where i feel the oxygen's been sucked out because of negative energy um and i think you want to be around people who aren't just work 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 
but have a little bit of personality and a bit of joie de vivre or fun about them as well. A bit of crack. A bit of crack. A bit of crack. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. And what would you say to a, a 22-year-old coming out of college um, who is the, the, the pandemic, COVID, you know, not jobs are difficult to find. What, what advice would you give them? I think, you know, uh, it, it's very difficult to... Um, to pin that down, especially in the middle of 2020, when all of our work norms have been thrown on their head in the last nine months. Uh, normally speaking, you know, if, 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 I think it's, it, you know, having people do things that they're, you know, I've always felt in my career that if you can treat your work like your hobby, then you're really onto a good thing. You know, obviously people need to be financially compensated and rewarded for what they do, but uh, doing something that you enjoy is a hell of a lot easier to, than doing something that you struggle to motivate yourself to do. So I think for young people trying to find something that they're actually interested in doing that gets them out of bed in the morning with a spring in their step is a hugely important element in that. Uh, you know, and I, I think it's nice if people can find a career where they feel that they can make a mark on something, whether it's philanthropic, whether it's uh, in technology, whether it's in any form of career, uh, I think people want to want to be able to say that actually I contributed to that and I'm proud of it. Uh, so I think that's another thing I would encourage people to try and look for when they're choosing a career. And, and because I know you 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 were recently in Jordan, where where um, you, you you visit some of the refugee camps there, and maybe over here we're we're a little bit cosseted as to the reality with some, certain young people that they they. they there's no oxygen for them to, they're, they're, they're stuck in these places, maybe to be, stand back and sort of breathe a bit and say how lucky they are. For sure. Uh, but it's very hard if people don't have that in their own zone of experience to be able to, um, you know, to be able to compare somebody else's existence or non-existence really with, with their own. Uh, but, you know, when I was visiting, uh, you know, refugee camps in Lebanon in the last couple of years, seeing eight or nine year old kids who've been taken out of school by their parents to sell plastic bottles on the side of the street, uh, sacrificing their ability to get an education to sell plastic bottles because their parents need the income to buy food. You know, that's a hell of a lot different from somebody deciding what their, you know, career choices are going to be coming out of school. Uh, not to, not to diminish that because that's a really important thing too, but it's also a privilege to have got to that point in your life and to be born into a country where that provides you with that opportunity. I understand. David, my, my next question is about networking. And you might just uh, share with us and the listeners your experience over 25 years. Uh, one of the other participants in, in the Career Scoop, Kingsley Aikens, was talking about this, and he's kind of a guru and uh, hugely experienced in it. You might share your experience going around the world and how networking has helped you move forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know... Um, net networking is obviously a massively important part of anybody's career development because nobody operates in isolation and ultimately, you know, everybody gets evaluated by their peers, selected by their peers, whether you're selling something or buying something, you know, which is what's, you know, greasing the wheels of business, I guess. So networking has got to be uh, taken very seriously. I think it's very different today because of the virtual networks that exist. To what it was when I was starting off 25 uh, or 30 years ago and uh, in those days a lot of this was done by word of mouth or friends and connecting through that and being introduced to people collecting business cards and so forth you know which became an obsession of mine at one point in my early career I used to categorize them by industry and stuff like that but that created a network and always gave you uh you know, the willingness to call something if you already had somebody, if you already had their business card or a connection. This sounds like being a frustrated lawyer that you have some, <laughs> some legacy from that training. But I mean, for example, you know, we have things like LinkedIn today, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, like most guys in their mid fifties, I'm not massively proficient on social media, although I do use it, uh, but I don't put myself out there through it as much as I could or possibly should. I remember talking to my son about this, who took, who, I, I was trying for, several years to get to 500 contacts on LinkedIn and he opened it up and a day later he had 1500 contacts because of all his Facebook friends, you know, they automatically linked up with him on LinkedIn. Now, 
whether that's valuable or not is another question, right? But uh, certainly the tools for people to uh, network today are, 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 are hugely available to them. The other thing I'd say about networking, James, is the difference between the sort of the home or virtual office versus the physical office environment. You know, I've done a couple of stretches in my career where I've worked from, from home just because of geographical remoteness or changes in different businesses and stuff like that. And I've always found that my tolerance for working from home or working, which is effectively is working virtually in my world, uh, is, is okay for about 12 months. But after that, it wears very thin on the ground because I think you start to feel disconnected from people because you're not spending as much time you know, managing or accessing uh, or, or refreshing your network as you would do when you're working in a physical uh, office environment. And, and I certainly don't subscribe to the theory that virtual office work is the way forward for everybody's career because of what's happened in COVID. I think as soon as COVID is finished and we're back to relative normality, uh, that people will be working from their offices again very quickly. Yeah, I think it's, it can be horses for courses as well that some people need. I know my father-in-law is 95, very, very, very wonderful, successful man, but he needs energy. He needs to he needs to sparkle off people every day. Yeah. And he says that that's what, what gets me through. So yeah. it's, just, it's as simple as, as that, no matter who they are. We used to call it the coffee cooler moment uh, or the, the water cooler moment in the States or the, the coffee machine moment where you just, you know, you hook up with somebody, you have a 10-minute chat, uh, and then you go back to do your work. I think that's really important for people's social interaction in the workplace. And I think you lose that in a virtual environment. Mm. That's not to say that virtual work isn't tenable. It's hugely tenable and it's really important. And I'm a big proponent of that. I just don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think they should operate together. Or maybe as you say that, just a thought comes to mind that people maybe should then double down and trying to do a little bit of networking around that. So they actually reach out to people. And and as one of the participants said, you should give something before you ask for something. Mm-hmm. It was really clever. Actually, there's some interesting technology uh, initiatives in that where there are virtual conferencing companies emerging now that are hosting conference purely in a vir- conferences in a purely virtual environment with networking built in and advertising and all those different things. It'd be interesting to see how much traction those types of businesses can generate to sort of replace real conferences with virtual conferences if that's a possibility yeah. that's that's hopping isn't hopping is that one of the yeah. that, that, yeah. that you're saying yeah. it's yeah. interesting and i think um uh patty cosgrave's business announced a similar initiative the web summit the yeah. web summit that they have the ability to do conferences for several hundred thousand people now online wow gosh that's uh to me, maybe it goes back to maybe watching watching some of those early cartoons when I was young, and they were kind of the things of the future has kind of arrived here. That Pretty much, of, yeah. You know. yeah. Where are you going to get your bag though if you go to a conference? You know, you don't get it. You know, you know. um, workplace stress. You know, you've been operating in a fairly interesting regions and at high high octane level. How do you how Two questions. How do you mind your, your own stress? And what would what would you say to a 22, 23-year-old device and when they start their career, how they might they might approach it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, workplace stress is definitely a fact of life in most people's career, whether it's I don't like my boss or my boss talks me the wrong way or I don't feel I'm being valued or recognized. I think people have... Uh, it's inevitable that people are going to leave when, they, when they're when they in work, they're going to have workplace stress of some, of some sort or, uh, or, or other. I think uh, it's a very different type of working environment today to when you or I started our careers, which were much more kind of patriarchal, I guess, or um, uh, less collaborative, let's say, than they are much, much more around instruction and learn what you're told, do what you're told, learn it this way, do it that way. Etc. I think people have much more opportunity to be collaborative in work uh, than before. Um, and, you know, the, the alternative to that being much more sort of individual focus, you know, and, and focus on what you are doing and am I doing it well? Am I going to get paid for it? And so forth. So I think it's very different in today's work environments, but doesn't mean it's not stressful. Um, I think uh, I've worked in environments where it was very sort of alpha in its in its tone and a lot of people were you know 
in conflict all the time. That's very can be very stressful as well. But I saw a lot of people fall foul of that and end up with you know severe kind of work stress uh, almost to the point of nervous breakdowns and stuff and so forth. So I think you have you really have to manage that carefully, uh, and everybody has to do it their own way. Some people like to do it by socialising, others learn their mindfulness or you know, their, their breathing and, and all sorts of stuff. I, I do a little bit of that. Um, I think that's a very un, undervalued uh, technique to be able to shut your brain down for a while and put your brain on ice and not let, you know, work or thoughts dominate uh, your life all the time. You've got to find space to be able to manage that correctly. Um, but I also think extracurricular activities, whether they're sport uh, or socializing or going to the theater or whatever it is, are great ways to break that chain where, you know, the only thing you think about is work, which is very negative. That's toxic. Yeah, no, it's it's, yeah. it's, it's getting the break, giving yeah. the, the, your, your, your brain a break. Yeah. On one level. Yeah. That's interesting. Because funny, everybody has their own individual way of, 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 of working working through that. My last question, um, five words to describe your career. Well, I mean, if, you know, thankfully you showed me some questions before we started talking because if I was to pick five words uh, right off the bat, I'd struggle. Uh, but my first word is up because there's been lots of ups. My second word is down because there's been lots of downs. Uh, my third word is diverse because I've had the opportunity to meet so many different people from different parts of the world, different religions, different outlooks on life. Uh, the fourth one is international because of travel. Uh, and the fifth one is fun. Fun. That's a good one to finish with. David, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me and hopefully the people who listen to this podcast will take great positivity and for for, for, for you sharing what you shared about your career to date. Thanks thank very you much. very much. Thank you, James. Great. Thank you for listening to The Career Scoop, brought to you by Elevate Career Advice and Elevate Executive Selection. I'm James Fitzsimons, and I hope you have enjoyed listening. Next week, we'll be talking to Deirdre Mortel about her career journey in the field of philanthropy. Hope to see you there.